Praise the Lord, Faith Apostolic Church. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. I uh, want to say that it's good to have each and every one of you tuning in with us. Thankful for your faithfulness. And I hope everyone enjoyed Sunday service. We had a, a great time here worshiping, singing. It was a good time in the Lord. Uh, I also want to say thank you so much, church, for your giving, uh, your faithfulness. You have you have just been just right on, right on time, and uh, God has has blessed, and, and thank you. So keep sending your tithe and offering in, uh, P.O. Box 824, Church Hill, Tennessee. Uh, we also thank you for those that are going online, doing the text to give. I'm sure that you have uh, seen that advertisement at the beginning of our video several times, so thank you for doing that. I want to get into the Word of God tonight for this Bible study. If you would turn to 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, um, I'm going to begin reading in 1 John chapter 2 at verse number, verse number 12. And the subject that I'm going to talk about tonight uh, deals very closely, very close to, to our heart. And matter of fact, it has everything to do with our heart. Um, let me go ahead and begin reading 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to go down to verse number 12 and read verses 12 through 18. Uh, as the Apostle John is writing, and he says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. He's writing, of course, to the converts, the church that he has uh, witnessed to in this epistle going back to two churches. And then he makes this statement after he commends them and kind of explains why he's writing to them and uh, that they have overcome the wicked one. He says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Of course, that term antichrist means one who denies or opposes Christ. One who denies or opposes Christ. In the apostles' writing, as he is speaking, he's commending them, writing to you fathers because, you know, writing to you young men because of this, writing to you fathers because... Uh, because you've overcome the, the wicked one, young men, you've overcome the wicked one. Fathers, you're strong. Young men, you're strong. There's, there's so much that's being written here and uh, understood that they are overcomers. They have overcome the wicked one. But as we read the scripture, verse 14 tells us, as he is commending them, they have overcome the wicked one. But then he gives them instruction Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. So we see that even though there is people who have overcome the wicked one, yet there is still the possibility of becoming ensnared by the world. The topic that I want to teach tonight, I'm actually just going to begin this lesson as I've gotten into it and, and studied into it. It turns out to be a little bit bigger than what I'm going to be able to do in, in one service. And this subject tonight is in the form of a question. And that is, are we Christians? 
Are we Christians? In the book of Acts, the book of Acts chapter 11, well, let me read Mark chapter, chapter 8 first. Mark chapter 8, the words of Jesus. He has called his disciples and, and he has his followers that have come to him. Then in verse 34 of chapter 8, just going to read it because it jumps right into it. Uh, it says, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, Take up his cross and follow me. Now that is not really the, the anthem of the world today because the anthem of the world today is be your own man, do your own thing, uh, do things your way, do what is right in your own eyes. But Jesus was telling his disciples and those that would follow him, he said, if you're going to follow me, Whomsoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Then he goes on and says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. So if we try to hold on to our life, to what uh, we feel and believe is what well, that's what we want that's how we want Jesus said if you if you want to gain life then you've got to let go of your life you've got to deny yourself but if you just choose to hold on to yourself hold on uh, to what you desire then you're going to lose it and then he says in verse 36 for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Just going to stop reading there, uh, Mark chapter 8. Uh, Jesus has called his disciples. He has chosen them, and he has followers. We know as the Gospels close out, the church comes together. The day of Pentecost happens. The Church is born into the kingdom as, as has been instructed by Jesus Christ. They tarried in Jerusalem till they were due with power from on high. The, the Acts 238 message was preached after the Holy Ghost was poured out. Uh, Peter preached that plan of salvation. And um, so there was commerce, there was souls added to the church. There was, there was people that came to the knowledge of the word of God and they realized that their lives needed to be changed. And that's what Jesus did. He come to save us. He come to save us from sin and save us from ourselves. Save us, of course, from the, the sin of Adam nature that we were born with. Um, but also to save us from this world. To save us from the wicked one, from wickedness, from unrighteousness. He come to save us from sin, in short. So that we would become... Children of God, sons of God, children of the Most High. And so the apostles and the disciples and preachers was, was going forth and declaring this message of Jesus Christ. They are preaching Jesus unto the world. Uh, the going out into places in the book of Acts, we can find missionary journeys, we can find converts, uh, uh, there was uh, 3,000 souls added to the church uh, in Acts 2. Another time talks about 5,000 souls. Uh, then there's the house of Cornelius. There's a uh, few souls there. Then as they keep coming, keep ministering, keep preaching and teaching uh, the, the word of God, then, then it's just noised abroad and the movement grows and people are preaching Jesus Christ. And they're not just preaching the name of Jesus, they are living uh, what they believe. Not just saying they believe, not pro just professing that they believe something, but they are living in a manner. Living in a manner. But let me just go ahead and go to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11 and, and verse number 22 is where I'm going to begin reading. It says, Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. 
who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people and the disciples. Now pay attention to this last sentence in this verse. The Bible says, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. They were called Christians first time in Antioch. Now, the disciples were not going around and telling people and, and hollering, hey, I'm a Christian. Hey, I'm a Christian. That's not what was taking place in Antioch. The Bible says that they were called Christians. That means that the people of that area, of that town, the city, the village, those people around there, they pointed to them. They pointed them out. It was not a self-appointment. It was not a self-proclamation. But it was others on the outside. Others that were not coming in to the church. Not those that were of, uh, was of the circle of familiarity, so to speak. It was, it was people on the outside that looked at them, looked at their lives, looked at their behaviors, looked at how they were living what they believed, and they called them, they said, hey, those are Christians. They called them Christians. The word Christian simply means to be Christ-like. And I understand today that it's a very popular term popular word in our world today. But to truly be a Christian, that by definition, it means to be Christ-like. It means a disciple of and who believes in the teaching of Jesus Christ. Or as the Greek and Hebrew dictionary declares it, to be a follower of Christ. So let me just lay this groundwork out there. The people of Antioch, the church, the believers, I will call them for the time being, the believers at the church of Antioch, they were not waving their arms. They, they were not trying to get people's attention and say, hey, I'm a Christian. That's not what was going on. They were not jumping on the popular bandwagon of the day. That wasn't going to the t-shirt company and getting t-shirts made, adorning t-shirts and, and creating logos. It was, they've got a lot of great stuff today. It, it, it really is. It's neat. Go ahead, purchase it, buy it, wear it. Amen. Be proud to be a Christian. Absolutely. But they were not putting up neon signs. The church in Acts chapter 11 was not putting up neon signs with flashing lights. They were not debating people's theology or ideology truly that uh, was not uh, declaring the perception of who they might be. They were, they were not out to make a name for themselves. Out, they were not out trying to, uh, trying to promote themselves in that manner. They didn't go around and, and talk to people and, and say, you know, I, I think this is what you ought to call us. This is, uh, no, they, they, they were just convinced in what they believed. They were convinced that Jesus Christ was the way, the truth, and the life. They were not defending themselves, perhaps, of a mistaken identity. If we, if we understand when, when this is said of them, and they are called Christians, the Bible it does not say anything of them standing up and saying, no, no, we're, no, don't label us that. No, it was a correct label. It was a correct name. They did not defend themselves against it. It's not a self-proclamation. Again, I want to make this clear 
as I'm laying some groundwork this first night, it's not a self-proclamation, but it was the people that was around them, the non-church, I'm going to call it that, it was the non-churchers that was around them, that looked at them and labeled them, called them Christians because they saw something in them. They saw something about them with their own eyes. They saw something about them and they felt a difference about them that was not like other people. It was not like other religions. It was not like the Pharisees or the Sadducees. It wasn't like the religious sect of that day, the Nicolaitans or, or any of those believers or followers. It wasn't like the Romans or, or anything like that. They, they saw something with their eyes about these people. And what they saw was that they bore a fruit in themselves of being like Christ. And that is... At the point that we're at in this, in Acts chapter 11, I, I think it's very safe to say they, they didn't only believe through the confession of their mouth, but these folks believed with their very lives. They didn't just say that they were followers of Christ. They didn't just say that they believed in Jesus. They didn't just have words. But what they lived was their belief. They lived what they believed with their very lives. I believe as a whole in this day and hour that we are living in, there is a challenge should be presented to us because we have become professional, so to speak, in going to church. I know right now we've got social distancing going on. We've become, though, trained and professionals, so to speak, about how to do church, uh, how, to, how to have a good worship service. We've, we've been to training. We've been to seminars. We've, we've been to music conferences. We've, we've, we've listened. We've read. We've studied. We, we know how to do things a certain way. But the truth is that in the hour that we're living in, there's a lot of people today that is self-proclaiming. Hey, I'm Christian. We, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm a Christian. But there, well, I should say it this way. There's a lot of self-proclaimed Christians. But is there really enough that are recognized as Christians because of the fruit that they have in their life? Because we, and I'm putting myself in that same category, I, I, need this, I need this lesson. Are we professing Christians, professing Christianity, or do we truly have a life that shows forth the fruit that points to the fact that we are Christians? Anybody can say, I'm a Christian. Anybody can lift their hand, label themselves, put themselves in a category, declare themselves, hey, I am this. I, 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 can, I can declare anything. That don't make it so. I can declare all day long, I'm a lawyer, I'm a lawyer, I'm a lawyer. But if you was to hire me on and we go to court together and stand before the judge, the fruit that would come from that would prove that I ain't no lawyer. I can declare all day that I'm a doctor, I'm a surgeon. But I guarantee it, if you had a condition in your life where you needed the surgeon, you don't want somebody that just, that's just got a declaration from their mouth, hey, I am this, I'm a doctor, I'm a surgeon. No, you want some credentials, you want some proof, you want some fruit. You want to know how many surgeries have you had? Is this something that you've done if you've done this procedure several times, what's your success rate, so forth and so on. So it is true of us today, we can proclaim Christianity. We can proclaim that we are Christians, but that does not make it so. So it is not just what you profess with your mouth. It's not just what you want people to believe and try to 
convince people with a few phrases and ideology, you know, wearing your t-shirt, wearing your logos, what would Jesus do, WWJD, uh, sporting all this stuff that, that somebody recognizes and says, well, you know, well, they must be Christian. It's not, it's not just, it's not the logos that's going to tell them. But what they need to, what this world needs to recognize is they need to look at the fruit that is in our lives. How we live. How we behave. How we respond. How we treat our bodies. How we treat others. Yeah. That's going to tell the world whether we're Christian or not. Truly. Truly. That's what's going to tell them. Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 7 verse 20. Now he's instructing his disciples on how to identify the difference between good and evil people. There's a declaration. I won't go into the message there, but just a few brief words of Jesus as he is telling them, you know, how to recognize people. He makes this statement. He says, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Now he was talking to some uh, well, talking to his disciples, but talking about some evildoers, some false prophets. And he is saying, this is how you're going to know them, by their fruits. Because it's what is produced from their life. That's what's going to tell the tale. Not just the words that comes from their mouth, but what is produced from their life. And I believe that we can understand that applies for us today. It applies to the church today. It's not just what we profess out of our mouth, but it's what we live in our lives. If you find a tree that produces apples, no matter how much that it screams and says, I identify as an orange tree, no matter if it's got apples growing on it, it's an apple tree. Same thing goes. No matter, you know, an orange tree you see oranges on a tree, you know it's an orange tree. You see apples on a tree, you know it's a, an apple tree. You see pears growing on a tree, you know it's a, a pear tree. A true Christian will bear the fruit of a Christian and be a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm extending a call out to Faith Apostolic Church and whomsoever would listen to this message. I'm a calling out tonight. A challenge. For us to search ourselves. And discover in our own selves. I'm not talking about pointing fingers at somebody else. And saying well you know that. This one. That one. No this ain't. Don't look over to the recliner beside you. Or the chair beside you. And, and start pointing fingers. No this is, this is internal. This is for us to look to the inside. Because I'm calling out for true Christians. Titled this message with the question, are we Christians? God desires, I believe with all my heart that God desires people to step up to the plate in this generation and fulfill the call. To deny themselves, even as he said in the New Testament, to deny themselves, to take up their cross and follow him. The apostle writer in the book of James exhorted the church in James chapter 3 beginning of verse number 10 said out of the sound mouth and out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren these things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree my brethren bear olive berries either of vine figs so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. We can label ourselves whatever we desire. We can declare and make self-proclamation, self-declarations. But our labeling really doesn't mount to a hill of beans, what we label ourselves. But it's the fruit that we produce in our life. That's what really tells the tale. That's what Jesus is going to be looking at when he comes to judge our lives. He's, 
He's going to be looking at the fruit. We could go into parable after parable. The parable of the fig tree. We could go into parables of what Jesus will be looking for. But he's looking for that fruit. He's looking not just for somebody saying, hey, I'm a Christian. He's looking for somebody who believes and lives what they believe. The fruit that we produce. So the citizens of Antioch, they were recognized. It was a difference. There was a recognizable difference between the church in Antioch and just regular folk. It wasn't just regular citizens. There was something different about them. There was a change that had taken place in their life. It was well noted and well noticed they had been with Jesus been with him in spirit. They had received the message. They had received the teaching, the, the preachings of Jesus Christ. It was handed down to them by the disciples, by evangelists and teachers and, and preachers. It was, it was handed over to them. And, and these people, they noticed that the fruit that was being produced from their lives wasn't like other people. They recognized it was like this man Jesus that we've heard about. This man Jesus, we've heard the stories. We've, we've heard the witnesses. We've heard the accounts of how he, how he was, how Jesus was and who Jesus was, the message of Jesus. And so they labeled them, they are Christians. I want to get into some more stuff, but I, I believe tonight that, that we need some inward search. We need to look in our lives. Pastor Cody needs to do it. We need to do it in our homes. Hey, judgment's got to first begin at the house of God, right? If we are wanting this world to receive a message of truth, and we sure do, we recognize that that message of truth is a message that will change lives because it changed our life. And the message that Jesus comes to deliver is a message of change to bring people out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And that's what was going on. The church at Antioch, this is just one instance in Acts chapter 11 that we read about, but that's where they were first called Christians. I don't want to be that person that has to tell people I'm a Christian. I don't want to be that one that, that has to, you know, for in order for people to know that, that we believe in Jesus, that, that we are Christ-like. I don't want to be that one that, well, you know, we've got a certain logo that we wear. We, we've got a certain emblem that we, that we uh, put on. And, and that's what lets people know. We have to be those that, as Jesus said, have denied themselves, taken up their cross, and followed him. We have gave our lives away so that we can gain the life that is in Jesus Christ. We have lost ourselves, so to speak, so that we can truly gain true, true living there's some things in the life of these disciples that evidently was, was not seen. There were some things in their life that was seen. I want to read a scripture as I, I'm going to go ahead and draw this to a close. I'd hoped it gotten further. Uh, but the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, oh, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 9. And he's writing instructions to the church. And we have preached this and, and taught it many times. But it's, it's something that is of great value. Instructions to the church. 1 Corinthians 6, beginning verse 9. He said, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. That lays it out there pretty simple. And then he says, and such were some of you. Such were some of you, but 
ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We were once servants of sin. We was once servants of unrighteousness. Many today have that testimony as, as these things, these, this list that is made in 1 Corinthians chapter nine by, uh, chapter 6 by the Apostle Paul. Many can say, yes, I was one of those. Before I came to, to Jesus Christ, I was one of those. I, I had that fruit. I bore that fruit in my life. But Paul said, you were. But thank God for the washing. Thank God for the cleansing. Thank God that he washed us from those things. By the blood of Jesus. We were by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by his spirit. We were washed. We were justified, sanctified. And now we are going on to walk in a newness of life. We are, we're not that old man. We're not that old creature. But we're a new creature in Christ Jesus. So now we want to follow him. We want to have our lives emanate. We want to be that reflection of Jesus Christ to this lost and dying world. They need it. So I ask you this question as I'm closing. I ask you this question. Are we Christians? We're going to go forward into the word and, and we're going to find out some things, some, uh, some things that Christians should be what we should be doing. Maybe we just need to reiterate some things in our life that, oh, yeah, I, I, need, to, I need to get back to where, where I need. We need to get back to those grassroots. Would you pray with me right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you, God. I, I give you thanks. Lord, I know the lesson, God, is short tonight, but I believe, God, that you are working something, something for our good. I pray right now, Lord, that you would guide us all. Lord, as there is social distancing going on and, and we've not been able to come together in church and, and families are, are come together in their home, I, I pray, God, that we would take this time to take advantage of this time. For some has even said, if I just had the time, I would pray more. If I just had the time... I would fast. I would read the word of God. I would devote some extra time. Lord, you have provided us that time. So I pray, Lord, that we would turn our focus internally. God, that we would assure our lives to be fruit-bearing lives. That we might, Lord, not just be professors of Christianity, but we might be called Christians. Guide us, O oh Lord. God, that we would... God, be what you'd have us be. Mold us, shape us, fashion us, almighty God, in the name of Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name. Church is going to be continuing this lesson. I just want you to know that, that God has great things in store for us. He has a life for us to live, and the Lord Jesus loves you. and He is bringing us, bringing us closer. As John said, he must increase, I must decrease. Let's let Jesus increase in our life. In Jesus' name.